Hi class, this is Sir Alex Pasco and welcome to our lesson in General Biology 2. We are finishing our discussion in lesson 5. Uh, today we are going to talk, to talk about lesson 5.3 which is all about uh, the mechanisms that encourage or uh, mechanisms that causes evolution among species. So previously we've discussed a lot about evolution, theories of evolution, and some of the evidences that supports evolution but this time what we are going to talk about today is what are the mechanisms or basically what are the factors that affect and or results to evolution so at the end of today's lesson what i want everyone be able to do is for you guys to be able to explain the mechanisms that produce change in population from generation to generation so some of the things that we are going to talk about today includes artificial selection, natural selection, genetic proof, mutation, recombination, etc. So let's begin our discussion with our discussion a little bit on the introduction of mechanisms of change. One of the things that highlights, highlights the mechanisms of change is the influence of DNA or genes. So as, as we go along and discuss these various mechanisms, we are you would see that uh, it is highly influenced by uh, genes or how genes is being transferred from one generation to generation. Uh, when we talk about uh, genes or as we talk about mechanisms, you would see some words such as genotype. When we talk about genotype or if you see the word genotype, it just means uh, it is something uh, that deals with the gene of the organisms and then you would also sometimes see the word phenotype which is the observable traits of the organisms uh, driven by the genotype so uh, gene genotype is basically the genes phenotype is the expression of genes it's the one that you see in the individual and then you would also see words such as allele allele is basically a variant form of a gene so let's distinguish these uh, three words even more. So let's look at the sample right here. These are sample of children with various degrees of skin color. No? And so genotype is basically the gene. So every single individual here has genes that has been passed on to them from their parents to from their grandparents, etc., etc. The phenotype is the observable trait. And as you can see, some of the kids here has lighter skin color, while uh, some of the other kids has darker skin color. So that is basically the phenotype, that expression, that observable trait that you see, that expression of the genes that they have. Allele is basically the gene, so for example, gene for skin color. So everyone has a gene for skin color, but everyone has a different allele of that gene. So everyone has a different variant of that gene. Uh, resulting in vari in variety in the skin color. So what I'm trying to say is the genotype is basically everyone has a gene. Everyone has a gene that expresses the color of a skin, right? And then each of that gene uh, could be could have a variant called allele. So they are the same gene. Uh, they are found in the same locus or place in the DNA, and that place in the DNA is specifically coding for skin color and they could be different sequences depending on the allele which results in different phenotype that we see today so I hope that is clear so again genotype is the genes that you have so for example the genes that code for your skin color or for your eye color and those genes can have variety uh, which we call allele so some a few may have an allele uh, that codes for, uh, let's say, brown pupils, while some of you may have an allele that codes for uh, uh, black uh, pupils. So you would see some individuals having very dark pupils or dark eyes, while some having brown eyes. So that is an allele. So the gene that codes for the black eye, eye color, uh, uh, everyone has that but uh, some people have different alleles or variants of that same gene and then the phenotype is basically the expression of that gene the one that you are observing the one that you can see so those are the words that i want you guys to be mindful about as we discuss these mechanisms 
another thing is that uh, when we talk about uh, evolution uh, and the change among species, one thing that you would notice is that variation is actually very important Bec or variation of genes or variation of alleles or traits is actually very important because it's the one that actually causes evolution and it is the basis for heredity. It is important it, it's because it gives advantage to the survival of a population. So for example, everyone here in this population has the same gene, has the same, um, oh, there's no variety in our, um, let's say, there's no variety in our genes. But what happens then if there is some deadly disease? If there's no variety in our genes, what happens is that everything will be wiped out. But uh, for most of the population that there is in the world, there is some form of variation that helps one particular individual uh, a little more different than the other. No? So what happens is, for example, if there is a very uh, infectious disease that could uh, be very dangerous to some people, some part of the population may probably pass away because of that disease but some population because they contain or they have traits or variety of traits that may be um, that may help them survive because perhaps it makes them not as susceptible uh, or not to be infected with that disease then they could survive so one of the things that is important when we talk about uh, mechanisms of change or evolution is that the importance of variation or it, or it is important for us or for the population to have variety not only skin color or not only in height but even in the things that we cannot see immediately such as our resistance to various uh, illnesses and diseases so let's talk about now or uh, let's go on now and talk about some of uh, the ways that evolution can happen so the first one is called the mutation now it's simple enough mutation is basically the changes in organisms dna and it is very important as it is a driver for diversity in the population so some species evolve because of the accumulation of mutations that occur over time so mutations, uh, you may immediately think mutations can be really bad, but some of the mutations that happen are actually not uh, very dangerous. Some of the mutations that happen in our DNA can be harmless. And what happens is that some of those mutations accumulate over a long period of time. And what happens is that that results into the evolution of the species. And as it happens as the generation keeps accumulating various uh, mutations that perhaps are not or let's think first are not very dangerous to the <coughs> organism then it could actually even lead to uh, another species or a speciation so from one species it becomes a different type of type of species because of that accumulated mutation so that's basically what mutation is so like i mentioned some can be beneficial some can be harmful and um, can be risky uh, some of the risks that includes is the development of cancer if you guys remember our discussion a little bit about cancer uh, it's actually a results in it's actually a, a disease that results from a mutation of your DNA and what happens is because there's that broken DNA it ha it influences the cell to keep duplicating and duplicating and that's what cancer is it's basically a mutated cell that keeps duplicating on itself because perhaps it doesn't have the stop uh, it doesn't have the stop signal for it to uh, stop duplicating or that the duplicating uh, signal is broken uh, keeping the signal on resulting in the cell to keep uh, multiplying on its own so some mutations can be beneficial some mutations can be very very dangerous and risky and there are different ways to uh, have mutation so for example this is your original DNA one is substitution where one or one code is changed 
one can be deletion wherein one was removed the other one can be inversion wherein the codes are switched together and then there's another one that is called insertion where is another uh, code was inserted along your DNA so some of the ways that or those are some of the ways that mutation can happen again we have substitution wherein one code was changed have insertion or have added one deletion where you remove one and inversion where in the code are switch so some of those are again are some of the uh, mutation that can happen along on your DNA but luckily for us our cells are equipped with you can think of it as self-correcting so when our cells are are duplicating we have uh, in our cells a way in order to correct some uh, mutation in our DNA or we have the mechanism in our cells to keep as much less mutation in our DNA as much as possible because again it may result into some very de uh, deleterious or very dangerous mutations in our body uh, one of the mutations that could happen uh, that was on your module is the drosophila or the fruit flies uh, some example of a very which is a, a very uh, is an example of a very dangerous mutation or in a mutation in the gene of a fruit fly can result in them having this uh, more white uh, eyes you know this white pupils and what happens is that when fruit flies have this type of mutation it's actually much more difficult for them to actually mate and reproduce so this you can think of this as an healthy uh, fruit fly with their red eyes wherein there's no issue or multiplying or uh, increasing their population and then there's uh, there are those that has a mutation wherein uh, the change in the DNA results in having white eyes and also results in them having much more difficulty in reproducing. So some mutations can occur spontaneously such as incorrect copying of DNA as it replicates. That could happen. So a lot of these can a lot of these mutations can just happen on their own. No, but also on some factors, some outside factors can actually influence mutation such as uh, the ray such as radiation too much uh, UV rays from the Sun uh, chemicals such as too much alcohol cigarettes and tobacco are all what we call mutagens mutagens are environmental factors or chemicals that can result in the mutation of your genes that's why on the label on uh, cigarettes the smoking kills or smoking can cause cancer that's because again like i've mentioned cancer is a is an issue of mutated dna which results in uh the replication of cells again and again without stopping and that could result in uh drinking or even or worst of all smoking cigarettes so i discourage smoking cigarettes or even drinking but that's on you guys uh, most of you guys or some of you are adults now or almost adults and I encourage you to use and be wise if you decide to use any form of chemicals or vices um, I discourage it but again that's uh, it's uh, for you to decide just be wise on it okay so that's one way that a change in the population happen or evolution happens is again first because of mutation so the second mechanism that influences mutation is what we call gene flow gene flow is basically a gene migration simply said uh, there is an introduction of new genetic materials from one population because one uh, organism from a different set of population migrated to that population so for example you have your population of birds here and they have this uh, allele right here HH -H, which codes for uh, this uh, gene or this allele codes for having a blue feather which is a dominant trait 
And then you have another set of population of birds with an each age, the small two letter H, which are recessive, which are recessive genes, which codes for having a red feather. So what happens in gene flow is that one organism or one of the population can be a group, small group, but let's just think of it as one. Uh, move from one population to another and then they started mingling because they are the same species they could still interbreed and re what results is a bird that has a combination of allele which has a recessive and a dominant allele so you have the capital H and small letter letter H so that's another way that influences evolution when there is a gene flow when there is a migration of one species to another uh, to another of their species but on a different population so this influences a little bit of change in the allele remember allele so this HH is basically uh, a gene that codes for let's say the color of your feather and the capital H codes for blue while the H codes for a red feather and since the small letter H is a recessive gene even if you have capital and small letter H, the e capital H have being dominant will be expressed, so the bird will still have a blue feather. But if this blue bird with a dominant gene move from the, their population to another population, you would see uh, you would see a phenotype of change. You know, there is a obvious uh, because the expression would be blue among all the red birds. Well, here, the phenotype may not be obvious, but the genotype is already different because the allele is different compared to the other which has their own pure uh, dominant genes. So that is gene flow, and that's one way to influence evolu evolution among species. So there are various ways where engine flow may occur. One is for plants where in pollens and spores could be dispersed to new location by form of bees, butterflies, and even wind. So from one particular place to another place because that seed or that spore uh, is being transferred from one place to another. Another way is for animals migrating to new locations such as our example here or it's for humans um, humans uh, moving to a different city or different countries and marrying in that city so for example you have an Asian uh, an Asian dad and a European mom of course they have different alleles of because if you look at the phenotype they are kind of there's kind of like a lot of differences right uh, you may th think of European as having white, fair skin and blue eyes, while the Asians have a little more yellow skin and having smaller eyes and dark black eyes. So what happens is that because of migration that is possible now, because of globalization and the advancement in technology that we can fly overseas, uh, there's a possibility of um, a mixing of the genes among uh, the species or uh, the human species because of gene flow one thing though that i want you guys to know is that although gene flow may not change the frequency of allele when we talk about uh, allele frequency is how often that allele is expressed in this population so for example you have four with pure dominant hh um, gene here and then one that has one H and one small H so what happens is that you have two four six eight nine so ninety percent uh, of the capital H is present in this population and ten percent for the small letter H so that's what basically a little frequency is ninety percent because there is what two four six eight and then one there so there's nine capital H and one recessive H H present in this population so 90% dominant H and one ten percent recessive H so that's what we uh, that's what we refer when we talk about allele frequency so again so with, with gene flow gene flow does not change the overall allele frequency so it will not 
uh, massively change it but can it can actually change the allele of a smaller population but not a bigger population so the next one that drives uh, mutation or not mutation that drives evolution among species is recombination we've discussed recombination when we talk about meiosis so recombination is the process where pieces of DNA are broken and combined to produce a new combination of alleles. So we've discussed this during our discussion in meiosis, more specifically the prophase 1 part of meiosis. Uh, after the condensation of the DNA resulting in this chromosome right here, so you have your parents chromosome you have your maternal and your paternal chromosomes right because half of your chromosomes came from your dad and ha the other half came from your mom so what happens is that the chromosome from your dad and the chromosome with, from your mom would align and what happens is that uh, there will be a crossover wherein they would actually switch alleles so this is an example of allele right here so you have your dominant c and you have your recessive see here so crossover is when they switch this allele and that is not an issue because this allele still codes for the same thing albeit a little bit different you can think of this again as simply let's say eye color maybe this uh there's this dominant allele here this c here uh codes for black eyes while the recessive c codes for blue eyes right so if you switch them together it will it will be an issue still because both of this are coding for the same thing albeit just a little bit different one is for black eyes one is for the blue eyes so that's what recombination is there's a switching of alleles across homologs homologs are basically uh, they are the same chromosomes so so for example this is your x this is your y this is your first chromosome this is your first chromosome from your mom this is your first chromosome from your dad okay so i hope you guys remember meiosis and remember crossover and recombination so recombination is very important uh, especially for the population or for a lot of species it's because it creates offsprings that is uh, different from their parents it's not just a carbon copy of your parent but a more unique version of a combination of your parents because of this uh, recombination and more uh, importantly even if you have a twin or even if you have um, yeah a twin brother even if it is a maternal not paternal maternal meaning uh, you you came from the same cell that divided paternal is two different egg cells that were fertilized right so the paternal twins are the twins that look very different from each other but maternal twins are the twins that look very much alike so even if you are maternal twins because of a combination you and your twins are still two very different and distinct individuals so this is our example earlier wherein we have our European mother and then you have an Asian father and you have been a combination of your parents genes and when you have child this combination of your mom and your parents genes would actually mix up and recombinant having a recombination so you would have children that are very distinct from you and from distinct from their grandparents because of the combinations of their genes so that is what recombination is so i hope that is clear if you guys have any question do not hesitate to message me okay next let's go on to our next example or mechanism of change which is the genetic drift genetic drift is the mechanism of evolution in which allele frequency of a population change over generations due to chance please do not confuse this with gene flow when we talk about gene flow it is the migration of one species to another when we talk about genetic drift it's uh, an evolution that is resulted uh, due to chance so there is randomness there it's all about chance and also it is not about migration there is no migrating happening so a lot of 
uh, reasons why genetic drift happens. One of the reasons is that some uh, parents would have more children than the other parents, right? So some parents have, let's say, five children. Well, you probably uh, you probably don't have a sibling or an only child. So because of that chance, that be because of that randomness, it actually can cause what we call a genetic drift. So what? Uh, so let's look at example here. So we have an example of a of a population right here wherein we have a frequency of genes so the capital of the recessive uh, d of 0.5 so 50 percent recessive uh, genes so those are the small letter d and then we have another 50 percent of the dominant d genes so those are all the capital b so the capital b codes for the brown color so even if you have a one recessive and one dominant the dominant will be expressed so uh, what happens is that the population of having one recessive and one dominant will still have brown coating so what if for example the, among this population of rabbits only five repopulated so what if this population right here probably died early or they did not find a mate so only these five were able to repopulate so what happens is that uh, only their genes are being passed on to the next generation so this is what happens on your next generation <coughs> so and you will only have uh, a gene of capital B or the dominant B uh, would have an increase of 70% and then the recessive genes will only have uh, 30 percent that would exist among generation and then let's uh, furthermore and let's go on so what if on our second generation only these two rabbits were able to um, procreate or to reproduce and the other the rest uh, died out what happened to the next generation is that they will all contain dominant gene because only the dominant uh, rabbits were able to repopulate and the other were none and just think of this is because of chance right so there is a shift in the frequency of allele so from just 50 50 to 70 30 from now to uh, fixation this is what we call a fixation wherein uh, the allele becomes fixed to all the population so what happens now is you have a change or shift in the genetic makeup of the generation from the original generation to the next generation through there is a difference in the genes now so that is what we call a genetic drift so genetic drift is important in large population or uh, this not oh you cannot easily see a change in large populations because in large populations, genetic drift won't be quick. But you would see uh, genetic drift in situations, for example, like the bottleneck. Or in, in bottleneck, there is an extreme example of genetic drift. Uh, it's because some part of the population were wiped out. It could be because of a disaster, for example, flood or uh, earthquakes, wherein massive numbers of the population die and a few survive. So, for example, COVID, COVID, we have about uh, millions of deaths all over the world. So that results, that would actually inevitably result in a little bit of shift or change in our um, frequency in our allele. It could. It's because of that extreme situation wherein massive parts of the population were destroyed or extinct can think of it were killed off right so bottleneck you can think of this bottleneck it's because if you for example if you put marbles in a uh, bottle and if you fill that uh, bottle of coke with uh, marbles and then you tip the m bottle down uh, only a few of the marbles would actually come out so you can think of that as the surviving population and then the rest in the bottles are the population that died so this could result in a change in the population because 
it could uh, result in a situation where in one population that contains a certain frequency were the ones that killed off right because uh, that trait that is coding or that gene that is coding for a trait that perhaps is not uh, effective against a certain type of predator or a situation that does not help them survive they all died off so that's an uh, example of a bottleneck uh, genetic drift another one is called the founder effect wherein a uh, part of the population uh, move from one from the population to another place in order to establish a new colony so what happens is that the population that move are the only ones that will pass on to their genes onto the next generation so what happens that is that the allele frequency or basically the genetic makeup of the population they came from is not representative of the genetic makeup of the population that will eventually come off from that group that left the colony so for example if i have these two white rabbits move and start their own colony what happens is that they will only pass on to their recessive genes so you will only have white rabbits here and then you would have uh could be a combination of a brown and white rabbit on this population where they came from so that is what we call the founder effect so that is the mechanism of change via genetic drift now let's talk about natural and artificial selection. So we talk about natural selection, which is uh, a theory by Darwin, wherein it's the survival of the fittest, or because of variation, uh, the population with a variation that is much more effective on the environment tends to be able to survive better than the population with traits that is not effective onto the current environment. And this is very important in evolution as well because natural selection is a driver of evolution. And one of the examples that we have is the story of the peppered moth and the mottled moth. I've discussed this a long time ago as well, wherein uh, before the pre-industrial era, you would have a population wherein you have more white moth than the black moth. This is the mottled moth and this is your peppered moth, right? but during the industrial period what happens to the birch trees that they start to be covered with soot because the factories during the industrial revolution it starts to emit smoke and this is smoke it starts to cover these uh, branches of trees and what happens is that the more paler moth the mottled moth becomes much more harder for them to actually camouflage so it's much more difficult for them to be able to camouflage and what happens is that they become more susceptible to predators such as the birds and then the bird starts eating the paler or the mottled moth leaving the uh, black or the peppered moth behind because they were able to camouflage in the darker uh, now the uh, which are not, uh, they were able to do of camouflage with the darker coloring of the trees so that is a type of natural selection and this type of natural selection although it happened naturally it is influenced by human because human activity can actually cause a lot of changes in the environment and what happens is that these animals are trying their best to be able to adapt onto the changes that humans are causing but still, again, this is again uh, an example of natural selection wherein because of the change in the environment, one population dies off or unable to survive because they have traits that is not effective in their current environment. Another way that evolution can happen is what we call artificial selection. Artificial selection is a situation wherein humans are directly influencing the change in the evolu or the evolution of a species. It's because, uh, or you can see this in breeding uh, dogs, right? So you would see some desirable traits in an animals or plants are being chosen by humans and they want to have those traits pass on to the next generation or even enhance those traits 
so when we talk uh, before we give an example here let's talk about some definitions so when we talk about species these are a population where in they, they can interbred so they can uh, have sex and able to reproduce so when one animal or an is not able to reproduce with the other animal uh, because of various ways so for example the reproductive organs does not match or that uh, the sperm and the egg cell does not match etc etc then they are not species but if the animals if a certain population can interbreed then those pop uh, those are what we call species and then we have situation called the microevolution in microevolution is that there is a change in frequency of alleles so one species may not look exactly like the other species but since they are subspecies they can still interbred with each other example of this is dogs since we have you know artificially selected the dogs so we have dogs that are much uh, much uh, smaller and we accentuated that by choosing smaller and smaller dogs like Maltese's and teacup poodles so we want to accentuate the height and the cuteness of that dog so we kept choosing a much more smaller dog and have that breed instead of a larger teacup poodle or we have for example like St. Bernard's uh, bigger dogs uh, like Doberman and German Shepherd so we selectively select those traits and have those um, interbred so what results is we have dogs that are could be very different from their from each other so they look different but since uh, they can still interbreed they are still the same species so we don't say species of for example a poodle versus a sp uh, species of a doberman or a species of uh, German shepherds it's because they still want they are still one species uh, it's just a microevolution wherein we selectively or artificially select the traits that we want but they can still interbreed from each other so that's why we have dogs like Pomsky which is a combination of a Pomeranian and Husky so things like that uh, not only in animals, but we can actually do artificial selection in plants. So we have artificially selected, for example, in the U.S. If you've been in the U.S., uh, the size of their onions there is massive. It's because we genetically modified it. And meaning we artificially selected bigger onions and kept reproducing that onions and we kept only planting bigger and bigger onions until in us you would actually see onions that are as big or bigger than the palm uh, than your fist you know so for example here so we have a plant here and then we artificially selected a part of that plant and then uh, we kept regrowing that part of the plant until it's such a way that it evolved into various uh types of fruits or vegetables that we eat so for example kale broccoli cauliflower you can see broccoli and cauliflower right so uh, all of these are actually related to a plant which is a wild mustard that we selectively artificially select a part and uh, we kept breeding or improving or enhancing that part so that is artificial selection versus natural selection and lastly let's talk about uh, the hardy weinberg equilibrium so what is hardy weinberg equilibrium so it's it's a situation wherein the population is not evolving anymore so if a population in a, is in a state called the hardy weinberg equilibrium there is no change in the frequency of allele and genotype meaning uh, from generation to generation the frequency of the alleles is not changing which results into the uh, same genotype the same phenotype from generation to generation but in order for this to happen uh, five criteria must be met number one there should be a, uh, the, there should be random mating number two it should be a very large population because like I've mentioned earlier a very large population is much more difficult to subject to evolution also there there shouldn't be a gene flow or there is no migration in this population 
uh, for it, there is no, there should be no mutation in their genes or in their alleles. And fifth, there should be no natural selection. So if you are able to satisfy all these five criteria, then the population will not evolve. And this is very important to identify because if you are able to identify the Hardy Weinberg from generation to generation, you would actually see that it is difficult for a population to not evolve. The population keeps evolving. In order for a population to stop evolving, all of this must stop or all of this must happen. There should be a random mating, meaning one population does not choose which type of population uh, they produce as long as in their same species, meaning they can mate. So for example, for a bull, uh, you don't have any preference. Uh, so if you are Filipino, you're ready to have kids with uh, someone from for example let's say Africa or let's say from Europe or let's say from other con uh, from other countries without any prejudice so there's random mating very large population there is no migration for in that population no mutation in their genes which is already very difficult to happen and then there's no natural selection so how do we measure this Weinberg equilibrium we have an equation for Weinberg equilibrium, uh, which is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equals to 1. P and Q is basically uh, the alleles uh, that is present in the population. So let's uh, give some examples. So let's say we have uh, two alleles, the dominant A and the recessive A. Let's have P as the frequency of A and let's have Q as the frequency of recessive A. And in our first generation, this is our original equation, we have 30% uh, of the dominant A and then we have 70% of our recessive A. So what we, in order for us to find how many population contains uh, double A, how many population contains uh, the allele recessive and dominant A so you have small and cap capital and small letter A and how many populations contains uh, only recessive uh, genes A we can use this Hardy-Weinberg equation so what we're going to do is we're going to plug in the frequency so if our dominant A has a frequency of 30% we will have that as, as our P so that's E squared. So what happened is <coughs> P is uh, 0 0.3 squared is equals to 0 0.09 which means 9% of the population has the uh, has the genes for or contains the genes for two dominant A's. So if we have our frequency of uh, recessive A as 70%, then we can use 2PQ to find how many percent of the population contains the, the genes capital A and small letter A. So 2 times P times, so that's basically 2 times 0.3 times 0.7 and it would actually give you 0 0.42 which means 42% of the population has uh, the dominant A and the recessive A and both of this since they have the dominant A will code for let's say in this in our example uh, black beetle so we have uh, about 42 plus 9 so that's 52 or 51 percent for of the black beetles and then let's have if we have a frequency of recessive A that has 0 0.7 so that's 0 0.7 squared, so we're going to have that at Q. So 0 0.7 squared is equal to 0 0.49, so which means our population has, 49% uh, of our population has the recessive genes. So that's how you find how many population of a uh, specific combination of DNA or alleles you have. As long as you know the frequency of the alleles, you are able to solve how many percent of the population uh, is uh, 
so how many population or how many percent of the population has the dominant a how many population uh, has the recessive a and how many population has the combination of both so we, since we're talking about hardy weinberg so this is a situation where in the population is not evolving so after computing this now let's assume some things our first assumption is that there's random mating meaning the black beetle does not only want to mate with black beetle and white beetle does not only want to mate with other white beetle so there is no problem waiting mating between the black and the white so think of it that way next is we have a very large population of this beetle and these beetles uh, there is no population or there's no part of the population that wants to migrate to another place also the alleles are not changing so we are not changed uh, there is no change in their dna and also there is no natural selection so meaning whether you have black or whether you have white coloring on your skin as a black or white beetle there is no issue surviving in your situation so if all of these criteria happens what happens is if you mate everyone again so we have this pool of our uh, big pool of our bugs containing their dna what happens is if you have a, if you use a punnett square to measure uh, the population you would end up with the same number of population so if we use our punnett square so if we meet a and a all over again so you would have 0 0.9 so that's 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 so you would have 0 0.09 uh, which means you have 9% of double dominant a so if we mate uh, the population that has 0 0.3 percent a and then another frequency uh, which has a 0 0.7 recessive a you would have 0 0.21 and then another 0 0.21 here because this one in square and you add them because they're both capital a and small a capital a and small letter a so 0 0.21 plus 0 0.21 42 percent so you would have a population of 42 percent for a capital a and small letter a dominant a and recessive a and lastly if you uh what do you call this um reproduce uh, the population that has uh, the small letter a so that's 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 so you would have 49 percent recessive a so it is the same uh, number of population from the first generation so this is your second generation now and as you can see you have the same a little frequency and you would have you would still have the same genotype and even uh, phenotype because there is no evolution and this is something that biology is checked to actually see if there is a there is a working evolution mechanism in a population or there is a factor that is influencing evolution in a population if they computed the allele frequency and computed the population and then the next possible population uh, they computed also the next uh, population and then they figure out it's the same a little frequency they can say that that species is not evolving but this is actually very rare because most of the species evolve okay so so that's what wine hide hardy weinberg equilibrium is if you guys have any question about this uh, do not hesitate to message me but that's all there is about the mechanism of evolution and that is the end of lesson five Thank you so much guys and if again if you guys have any question just message me anytime and may you guys have a great day thank you so much